welcome everyone. I'm glad you could join us. Uh, this is PASA's uh, fourth um, policy listening session. Um, it's a little bit of a different format uh, than our usual webinars where we sort of talk to you for an hour. Um, myself and our three wonderful panelists today are each going to frame the issue of meat processing and production issues from their particular point of view. And then we're going to open up things so that you can ask questions. And as um, Gina mentioned, that will be through the Q&A function. And I, I do note the irony of having a listening session when we can't actually hear you out loud, but this has um, been working pretty well for us. So we encourage you to send your questions in. I also wanna give a special shout out uh, today to teacher Jared Armstrong and his class, um, agriculture class from the Mifflinburg High School who are joining us today. Um, I'm gonna spend a little time talking about sort of the issue from a federal level and a little bit um, on the state level. And then I'm gonna hand it right over to our panelists who are each in turn gonna to talk to you from their particular point of view. Um, for years, uh, the Farm Bill and federal policy have encouraged the consolidation of the meat processing business. As some of you may know, um, beef uh, actually uh, is processed by 80% uh, of the processing in beef is really done by only four um, companies. And similar trends have been true through the past few decades for other livestock, poultry, um, pork, and others. Um, today, there are 800 federally inspected slaughterhouses nationwide, um, and there are 1,900 state inspected or custom exempt facilities. To put this in a little context, there were more than 10,000 uh, meat processing plants in 1967, which is when the law mandating US inspection passed. So there's been tremendous uh, consolidation of the industry. The current pandemic has exposed the vulnerability of this concentrated um, industry. There were certainly issues beforehand, but I think they were not quite as transparent and transparently vulnerable as they are during the pandemic. Um, one of the things that happened in March as the pandemic took hold is that workers in some of the larger plants came down with COVID-19. Um, some of them closed. Uh, small plants saw a huge influx from some of the producers all across the country. Wait times became um, from several weeks perhaps to sometimes now two years out. And some produ uh, producers even had to resort to euthanizing their animals. Um, at PASA, we've been listening and um, to our um, members, to farmers, to producers, and to processors, and trying to um, advocate for more resources for small meat processing. Pennsylvania is actually um, one state that has probably more of these than many states. So um, we've had some resilience, um, but we're gonna hear a little bit more about how that's worked on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and again, these, um, sort of system-wide um, issues are not new just since 2020. They've existed for some time, but I think uh, the pandemic has just exposed them as um, shakier than we thought. There are currently several bills in Congress, um, two of which were introduced before the pandemic. These include the Prime Act and Ramp Up. Um, they have stalled for a variety of reasons. Um, they're getting a little more attention now and because of the pandemic. And they've been joined by a third bill that was just introduced this fall. I'm gonna mention it by name because it's kind of a combination of um, both of the others. Um, it was introduced in September by uh, Representative Shelley Pingree of Maine, who's a Democrat and Representative Jeff Fortenberry of Nebraska who's a Republican, it has some bipartisan support, and it seeks to add more flexibility um, into meat sales across state lines. It would provide um, more help for states to assume federal inspection duties, and it has more resources for small processors. 
It's called the Strengthening Local Processing Act. And one of the other unique elements of it is it would provide more uh, funding, federal funding for training um, new meat processors for more students who are interested to um, get that training and, and get into the business where there is currently a shortage of workers. Our panelists today include a small meat processor, Jay Young of Rising Spring Meats, um, who's up in the State College area, a meat producer, Mike Kovacs of the Walnut Hill Farm, who's also an officer of the Pennsylvania Farmers Union. He's out in the Western part of the state. And Josh Scheinberg, who's the Eastern Regional Director at the Department of Agriculture here in Pennsylvania. So you've got kind of a, a series of job, um, uh, different perspectives as well as geographic um, diversity. Um, we, um, are lucky here in Pennsylvania, in many respects, we have a state level farm bill, which was the first in the country. And that farm bill last year introduced a small grant program for small and very small meat processors. Um, hopefully Josh will be able to give us an update on that today. Um, Pennsylvania has also received quite a bit of stimulus funding through the CFAP program that um, helps farmers and uh, producers make up some of the losses they've seen under the pandemic in sales. And um, Pennsylvania also assumed um, some of the federal funding at the state level for the Fresh Food Financing Initiative or FFFI, which again has helped um, in particular some of our small meat processors with resources to expand their operations, which is really needed at this time. So hopefully we'll be able to um, hear a little bit about those and uh, possibly we'll continue to follow this issue, which is very important to so many aspects of farming and agriculture. And we'll be working to bring you the latest in opportunities and assistance. So with that, I'd like to turn the mic over to Jay who uh, with Rising Spring Meats. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so I, I've made a, uh, a list of thoughts, so I try not to try not to uh, get off track, which I'm prone to do here. But I think the, the first thing that I think of is getting people into this business. Um, I think we need to support um, with all our hearts and minds um, mentoring and education programs. I think specifically about Jonathan Campbell at Penn State. Um, you know, I understand he's going to start a program here. The university started a program. I can't support that strongly enough. And I think we um, we need to all be talking, supporting that sort of thing, and encouraging any young people, um, you know, even older people, uh, looking to switch careers. Um, you know, we, we the the narrative. You know, when you hear uh, meat processing um, on a large scale, you tend to hear people that don't have other options, like they go into this profession because that's what they can do. But uh, if there was ever a time that demonstrated the mission driven nature of what we do, uh, this is it. And I, I think I'll tell you, my, my guys are, you know, we're, we're going as fast as we can and it, it is draining everybody. And it's, it's um, again, I'll, 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 I didn't realize about myself or I hadn't really identified it. Um, the extent to which I'm only here because we need access to markets for our farmers. If, if the slaughter sharps aren't here, if Smuckers isn't doing it, if Leona's not doing it, if Lehigh Valley's not doing it, if, if uh, Bo Ramsberg's not doing it, if, you know, I'm just naming all the people that I talk to a lot, but, um, you know, we're, we become a bottleneck or the, the lack of shops is a bottleneck and we become a um, impediment to getting product to market. And it's extraordinarily disappointing uh, for me. You know, I, I might come at it from too mission-driven, too heartfelt a uh, purposefulness. But uh, um, you know, if you call, if you, you know, I've trained everybody to call and text me, and I'm trying to get away from that. We've we've hired a person, Sandy Miller. She sits at the desk and schedules people uh, because she can just passionately say, "Look, we just can't do it." Whereas if you call me, I'll say, "Mike, God, you know, we can't do it, but I'll figure out a way." And that's a problem. It creates, um, 
it creates a challenge for our team, um, for inspection, um, for for you when we when we we make a bet we can't cover. Um, but it's not um, it's not out of a desire to take more business. It's out of a desire to get you across the line to what you need. Um, you know, we, I'm very defensive for other producers. You know, we'll every, I think we all get calls to say, well, this person, you know, this company, uh, I had them scheduled and then they turned me around. And, um, uh, you know, if we say no, we mean no. And, and I've, I've got to learn that. And, you know, you've got to understand it's coming from the best place possible. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've listed a, a number of things I've heard, you know, arguments that people make, like, I'm running out of feed. I need you to kill my animals. I need to get them off my feed. Um, if you can't kill them, I'm out of business. Um, I've been, I've been with you for years. I'm depending on you. You know, now you have other people here. Um, you know, I'm getting pushed aside for other customers. Um, you know, what am I supposed to do? My customer needs it. Like I have sales, like, uh, you know, here locally, Ways Fruit Farm, they would take a beef a month. We don't have room to add a beef to our schedule. And that's just, it's heartbreaking. Um, I've got, I, I had one person walk in and we'd, we'd scheduled six animals. We were able to do four. They need the other two. Um, you know, come in very angry and said, I don't care about what other producers need. I need my animals. And, but the thing is, we have to care about what everybody needs. And we have to balance one person's needs against another. And we have to balance our team's needs, um, that sort of thing. So it's very difficult. So let's support mentoring education programs. Let's get people into this industry and not treat it as something second class. Like the people, butchers should walk around the community as proud members and when people see their butcher they should think i'm glad that guy's around or that lady's around um so i, I will say i see on my time is really fast um you know that that civil eats article that just came out uh, brought up the overtime charges um we're all working overtime to cover these bets like to get you in to get you through um, now, small plants, so this falls on small plants, so we, we apply the charges that the USDA charges over a much smaller, you know, base of business, so it, it costs us much more. So, you know, do we think about things like raising rates and charging more? And we do, uh, but do you want us to do that? Probably not. So it seems like anything, um, anything people out there in the public and particularly people in government do to support what we do, like allow us to get more across the table for not so much more cost, um, it supports us. It sort of help help us help you um, because our the costs are high out of the bankroll, the costs are high on our bodies. And you know it's just it it's it's difficult. Um, I will say, and I see my I just hit five minutes, I know that. Um, so I'll try to wrap this up. But um, uh, the grants are wonderful. It's the first time we've uh, it's first time we've uh, had grants or been dealing with them. Um, but one thing about it is, in a company like ours, at least ours in particular, is the depth of the bench is so low. Like we, everybody is doing something all the time, and you know the energy to the energy to write the grant, the energy to say yes, I got the grant, and then the um, time to plan it out. And then particularly with this latest, the uh, uh, FFE grant, I forgot the exact ac acronym, but you know, it's got to be spent by the end of November. So then you have to have contractors. We've been, I'm sitting in cooler that was supposed to be up and running in my mind, uh, June 1st and then July 1st and then August 1st, but the, the contractor doesn't have the time to get in here because everybody needs him. Just the same, he, he is to us what we are to our farmers. Um, so we can't move faster than they can move. So, you know, we work with companies like Kitchen Table Consultants to help us keep our heads on straight, but they can only, they can only do, um, they can only react to the information we can give them. And, you know, we've been, it's, it's difficult just to get on a call to have, you know, the end of the, yes, I'll call you at the end of the day. And at the end of the day, you're just so spent. Um, but, uh, I, I think I'll just summarize the last thing I was going to say was uh, there's a lot of talk about lowering barriers to entry for new shops. I'm all for new shops. I would support anybody who wanted to go into this business. I think the state of New Jersey, from what I hear, needs slaughter shops in a desperate, desperate way. And I understand that their DEP stands largely in the way of that. 
I think the secretary, like, in my maybe I'm saying too much, but the secretary of agriculture needs to get with the Department of um, Environmental Protection and say, look, you you've got to understand what we've got to do, and you you've got to lower, you know, we can there's safe ways to do what we need to do. You can't just make us a dead stop. Um, and I just hear about New Jersey because they're next door. I'm sure there's other states with similar issues. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm for regulation. I think I you know I'm, I think inspections should be in here. Um, you know, they are part of our team, not in a cozy sort of way, but they make they make our business better. They make everything about this industry better. Um, and that may be because I you know I may say that because I've I've dealt with what I think are very good inspectors and the one is sitting right behind me so he can hear what I'm saying and he thinks of, I feel like I'm brown nosing but I'm not they're really good people um, they keep us on the straight and narrow and or try their hardest um, so in terms of new encouraging new businesses yes encourage new businesses do i think money spent on existing up and up and going businesses is probably more effective at a short-term level yes i do I, I think you know a company like ours is already moving to get a new company up and going is going to be difficult um but it's a two-pronged two-pronged attack i would support in either direction i'll talk about both sides of my mouth there so all right i'll shut up thank you thank you jay that was very passionate and um very clear how hard you guys are working and you know how much additional help you could use um at this point i'm going to turn it over sure. to michael kovac who uh, maybe mike you can uh, give us a little sense of your operation and then some of the issues as you see them yeah mostly i'd like to yield my time to uh, jay from rising springs please uh, i'm michael kovac from uh, mercer county he summed up a lot of the things that i would have mentioned um very well uh we raise grass-fed beef and lamb, um, silver pastured pork and pastured poultry, uh, and sell direct to consumer here in Mercer County. And for about the last seven or eight years, we've steadily grown our business, uh, probably about 20% a year. I was really happy with that. Um, we're seeing, uh, at, from the start of this pandemic, we grew immediately exponentially, but we're very much throttled by what we could get processed. So our processor is about a half an hour away, which isn't too bad. It's a, a red meat processor. You know, Whiting's down in New Wilmington uh, also got hooked up with a, a similar grant to what Jay was talking about uh, and are, are facing the same sort of challenges and getting things spent. Uh, likewise, our farm got a small grant as well. Uh, I just got the last of the the things that ironed out for that today. That'll lead me into something after a minute here, but uh, just for more background on our farm, um, direct to consumer, we pretty much uh, run a farm stand at our farm. We sell about 95% of our product to people who drive up our driveway and see the critters that we're raising. So uh, we feel like the, the community that's grown up around that is invaluable and something that's been lost in the, in the American countryside or landscape. Uh, to the detriment of a lot of rural communities and rural economies uh, and community most especially. The, the, the recipes that get shared across the, the counter and stuff like that are, are, are our favorite part and, and we never expected any of it to be honest. So, but um, we'd like to see a lot more like us and what's required for a lot more like us is a lot more like Jay and a lot more like Sam Whiting and a lot more like Ken and Cunningham's and Smuckers and all the others. Uh, we've lost a vast amount of the infrastructure necessary to really uh, allow rural communities to thrive. Uh, we've consolidated to such a point that uh, if my poultry processor, which is now about two and a half hours away, I have to drive to Ohio uh, to ab about uh, two and a half hours away to have poultry processed under USDA regulation or uh, inspection. And that's what's necessary for me able to sell the cuts that Americans have become accustomed to, the boneless, skinless breasts and the wings and the, you know, the thighs and everything like that. Um, those all have to be done under inspection. Well, my next nearest option is probably at least six hours away. So effectively, if the one plant that I've got access to for poultry, which is all the way down in Southern Ohio, um, Holmes County. Uh, it's run by a plain sect fellow by the name of Aiden Troyer. Does a great job. They've expanded recently, but uh, 
you know, he's it. If it's not for Aiden, I'm driving to the Carolinas, most probably, or Virginia at the least. Um, we're really in an eggs in one basket scenario with our food system right now. And, and that the pandemic really spotlighted um, just how fallible we are in any kind of crisis. So by doing the things that Jay's talking about and, and expanding the producers that we've, or the, pr the processors that we've got and, and incentivizing a workforce to staff a new generation of expanded regional processors, I mean, we're lifting a lot of boats, not just the farmers, not just the processors, not just, the, we're talking about everybody eats. <laughs> and, and, and it became glaringly obvious that the system that we rely on to do that is very fallible and on, on very shaky ground because we've got so many eggs and so few baskets. So that's my um, involvement in Farmers Union and in PASA and, and in all these groups that I, I, tend to, I, I always say I have a problem with my hand, it keeps going up. Uh, but it's driven by this uh, really severe lack that we've got of support for a resilient food system. And so we're starting to see some, some um, encouraging legislation. Some of the ones that Sarah mentioned uh, are extremely encouraging. We need to keep beating that drum. The FFFI program that, that Jay referenced, uh, that I referenced earlier uh, is, is great. Uh, its implementation this go around was a little bit difficult uh, just because there were some really weird time constraints. Like I said, we just got the contract on Monday of this week. We have till the end of November to spend it. And there were 15 other things after that that we had to resolve in order to do so. So I think in the long term or maybe in the medium term, like an advocate for grantees from start to finish of the process to make sure that these funds that are so well legislated for uh, are accessed by the most folks that can make the biggest splash. So I'm um, looking forward to engaging further in this conversation and, and I'll uh, let it go at that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mike. Um, thank you to both you and Jay. Uh, the amount of time that these guys spend outside of their normal full-time, very demanding jobs to make things uh, work better is, is really appreciated by the whole agricultural community. Um, Josh, I'm gonna look to you next. Um, Josh is the Eastern Regional Director at Pennsylvania Department of Ag. And um, given what we know about um, from Jay on about our neighboring state of New Jersey, it sounds like things are possibly doing a little better here in Pennsylvania, but give us an update. Sure, can you hear me okay? All right, thank you. So, you know, look, I'm, I'm humbled to be, uh, you know, speaking virtually with, with both you, Jay, Michael. Um, you know, we appreciate uh, everything that folks like yourself are doing, as well as the broader uh, small meat industry. And, you know, I'll talk a little bit about today how, you know, we're looking to support you guys any way we can. So, you know, real quick, look, good afternoon. Thanks, everybody, uh, for joining in today. And thank you, PASA, for the invitation to speak. Uh, I'm a little new to the uh, Department of Agriculture, so I'll just uh, quickly introduce myself here. Uh, I'm a central region or the Eastern Regional Director. There's two other regional directors, a Central and a Western. We were uh, positions created at the start of the year uh, uh, by the Secretary uh, of Agriculture, Russell Redding. And we're really here to connect with folks like you, the stakeholders in the agriculture community. So, you know, me and the other two uh, regional directors, we're here to be an advocate and a resource for you. So I'm going to put my email in the chat box after this, and I, I really encourage you to reach out to me. Uh, we want to hear from you. Um, your voices are very critical and important, uh, and I can tell you that we take them seriously. So personally, you know, I spent the last 10 years or so working in the meat industry myself and in academia supporting small meat processors. So you know, this topic in particular is, is near and dear to me as well, uh, as well as the secretary. So, you know, since we don't have a lot of time today, I'll, I'll just quickly, you know, touch on some things that have already been, been discussed. So as, as many of us are aware, you know, while the larger meat industry and the larger meat processors in Pennsylvania in particular have returned to somewhat normal capacity levels, um, you know, the small processing meat industry continues to be strained in many different ways. It's multifaceted. It's complex and you hear stories that Jay has talked about, that Michael 
uh, folks like Smuckers that were mentioned. We hear these these stories a lot. Um, you know, we understand that there continues to be a backlog in the slaughter capacity. That's certainly a theme that we hear a lot. And and all the while, the consumer demands for local meat continues to rise, which again is is an interesting situation uh, and can be a good thing. You know, but as a department. You know, I can assure you that we are taking a concerted effort to examine this issue uh, from the state level. Uh, and the secretary and others are really serious about lending our support to bolster the small meat processing industry. So, you know, it's important to note today and some, some, some of the grant programs were mentioned already, but even prior to the pandemic, the department had recognized this gap. And through the 2019 PA Farm Bill that Sarah had mentioned, uh, there was a grant program called the Very Small Meat Processor Grant Program. Um, now, it was humble in its beginnings, uh, and I think the intent was always to expand things like this. So there was about a half a million dollars that was provided to small meat processors to uh, assist with uh, in areas to, to start a new operations to help with passive planning and these other kinds of things. And so it was well oversubscribed, almost by a million dollars. Uh, and we were happy uh, to provide that grant out there. Um, we are hopeful that this program will be supported and funded uh, again this year, uh, but that right now is a little uncertain as many of us know the budgetary constraints in the state. Um, and so we, we certainly encourage you to reach out to your local legislators and tell them how important programs like this were to you. And that includes the Fresh Food Financing Initiative COVID relief fund that Michael mentioned uh, we want to be able to support processors with grant programs like this, um, but we need your help too to uh, let our legislators know how important that is. So, you know, outside this program, and I'll hit on a little couple things here with the remaining time, uh, outside the grant programs that were discussed, you know, we're engaging a lot of folks like, like yourself on the calls today, uh, experts in these areas, you know, AMP is, is one that I can tell you we talk, uh, I've talked to personally, have a good relationship, the American Association of Meat Processors, and others like it who represent small meat processors. Uh, PAMP, of course, is a subset, the Pennsylvania Association of Meat Processors, and Eastern Meat Packers, who I've worked with personally myself. And there's many great folks that are in these organizations, uh, like Jay and others, that have great perspective. You know, we know starting a slaughter plant is expensive. You know, there's been many feasibility studies across the country, um, and we're talking in some cases for new facilities in the millions of dollars. Uh, we know that these require a steady supply of livestock and poultry to maintain viability. Uh, we know that having livestock and poultry in a reasonable distance from these plants is critical. Having a trained and available workforce is critical and a challenge. So while PDA is certainly looking to expand the current grant programs, as I mentioned, I think we still need to determine where future aid and support is best utilized. You know, is it to help the conversion of custom plants to USDA inspected facilities? Is it to expand the current uh, USDA inspected facilities, aid startup of brand new facilities, as I mentioned, or some combination with that? There's also the question of state inspection, which, which is important, which comes up frequently, and we can talk about that. Um, and then there's the education training needs, which, you know, Jay had already highlighted in program that Penn State is starting with Jonathan Campbell, who I think is on today. You know, these are the kinds of things that we're looking at, and we're really trying to hone in on what, where are the areas that the uh, department uh, can assist with. You know, there's also the challenge of providing technical support to help navigate the complex regulations which apply to meat and poultry processing. You know, there's years, decades of regulation that has been passed in, in both areas, meat and poultry, and it's confusing to both regulator, or, uh, processors and consumers, and we want to be able to support uh, uh, technical support in those areas. So that's another focus. So look, this is an ongoing conversation like we're having today. You know, Department of Agriculture, like I said, we're, we're seeking your input in this area. So again, uh, I encourage you to reach out to me. You know, we're, we're, we're going to be continually speaking with, with PASA and other groups that are also looking into this and looking forward to uh, continue the conversation. Thanks very much, Josh. Um, you took that job at an interesting time. Uh, 
Um, before we get um, into our questions from listeners, um, I had a quick one just to follow up for Josh. Do we have a handle on how many processing uh, facilities there are in Pennsylvania? So I think the, the if we're talking USDA inspected facilities, um, I don't. I knew I was going to get a, asked that question. I don't have that. It's available. Uh, we can the USDA FSIS posts all. Um, there's a directory of all the USDA inspected plants in the country. Um, I can get that number for you. I don't have it off the top of my head. But I think what's the the question that that we're looking at more specifically is how many custom exempt. Uh, establishments are there? How many retail exempt uh, establishments are there? Because these are also resources for consumers to find meat. And I think this is something that, um, you know, gets lost in a little bit of the minutia of the regulations that, you know, you can go in on uh, shares of an animal and you can have those, uh, those animals slaughtered at a custom facility and get that meat. Um, as a direct to consumer service. Uh, retail butchers, retail exempt butchers are also uh, critical to providing a source of meat for the consumers. So, you know, I think there, there needs to be some more education in this area so that the consumers understand that they can find meat uh, uh, outside of just their, their local supermarket. Thank you. We got a we got a little help from one of our listeners, John Campbell. Just uh, I knew he said, was going to have that <laughs> <laughs> in the chat box. There are 97 USDA uh, plants in Pennsylvania, which um, and 359 total meat processing plants. So um, that's quite a few, especially um, compared to the national total, if that's correct. In the last civil eats. Um, publication of 800. So um, Pennsylvania has quite a, quite a share of these. That said, I think we've heard there's still quite a bottleneck. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start to um, relay some of the questions that we're getting. Um, first question, and again, I think this could be any, any one of the panelists, feel free to jump in and answer. If you could prioritize the addition of processors for specific species, which ones do you think are the most important to get up and running or expand um, for existing plants? Red meat, poultry, et cetera. Expand red meat and increase poultry. We, we haven't poultry options at all. And, and then start adding uh, red meat. It, the, the barrier to entry to get into poultry, uh, raising poultry for a farmer and the popularity of that uh, meat in the United States is uh, makes it a no brainer. I mean, you gotta, you gotta make it easier for more folks to diversify their income streams on their farms um, it, it, and enhance their pastures if they're uh, pasture people because nothing does a better job on, on a, a uh, pasture after, after uh, cattle than, than poultry. Um, and that to me makes it a no brainer that first and foremost, not maybe foremost, but with expanding our different capacity, um, figuring out ways to, to add capacity for poultry, whether that be with a mo uh, mobile unit. Uh, there, there's some of those I know have been tried. I'm not sure what the success rate on them have been. Uh, that is one of those things that makes sense for uh, red meat, maybe not so much, because if you're going to knock a, a cow in the head, you still got to hang it up for 14 days or so, or 21, depending on how much freezer space you can talk your processor out of, right, Jay? Uh, <laughs> but the, the poultry can go uh, as soon as it's chilled uh, for sale. So there's there's a, a it's a lot easier uh, thing to do mobily on farm uh, than than say large ruminants or even uh, small ruminants. That's my take. <laughs> Jay, did you want to stab at that question? Oh yeah, the, the uh, I've I've always thought that the poultry processing was the number one. If anybody wanted to make an impact in the state of Pennsylvania in agriculture really fast, that would be it. Any young person with any set of brains and a back um, can do it. And uh, you know we've gone after different processors that 
do it really well. Like Eli Rife, he's the best chicken killer in Pennsylvania right now. Uh, but he's slammed with, with uh, you know, custom. He doesn't need to do it. So, you know, we've got to find some bodies to go ahead and take that bull by the horns. But you've got to want to do it. You've got to have the mission. You've got to have the passion to do it. And um, I can't imagine that it wouldn't be rewarded with appreciation um, and customership very rapidly. I mean, because a person in the state of Pennsylvania, like I look at, at Pennsylvania is the basket. Everybody thinks of New Holland and Lancaster as, as the bread basket, but the whole state should be a bread basket for Washington, Rochester, Philadelphia, New York, Boston. Like we have the farms, we have the land, we have the weather, we have everything. We don't have the big massive fields of Iowa and Kansas and that sort of thing, but we have the people. Um, you know, when we walk, you know, I used to drive into the city, into New York for Happy Valley, working with Dan Honig. And in my my vision of it, as I drove into, into the city was like, you know, you're, you approach the city from 100, 200 miles away. And as you get there, it's closer and closer. And all those kitchens, all those mouths, and it's the same way with Philadelphia or, um, or Washington. I mean, we're right in the, we're, 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 we're not next to anything, but we're not far from anything either. So, um, yeah, I think I'm starting to babble, but you get, you get my point. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, Josh, I'm going to give you a, a chance to sort of answer that question from PDA's perspective. We also got a question that's similar, which is, has anyone been doing mobile processing in Pennsylvania? I assume that's mostly in regard to poultry. Um, I have seen reports of startup companies that fill the need for local processing. Well, I will mention um, out of the small meat processing grant uh, last year, um, one of the grantees is the Republic Food Enterprise Center in Fayette County, uh, who was awarded $25,000 uh, to start a mobile processing trailer um, for southwestern Pennsylvania. So um, I'm not sure, maybe they're on, um, but uh, not sure what their progress is on that. Um, there, I know there's been just in my past, you know, there's been mobile processing units in the state off and on through the years. And I think they've struggled just due to the feasibility of it, the economics of it. Um, it's certainly something we're, we're looking at supporting pot. You know, I think from a state perspective, we're open to all and any ideas at this point. You know, we know poultry, I would agree with Jay and Michael. I think um, poultry for years has been um, an issue as far as slaughter capacity. Uh, the only caveat I would say to that is there's a little bit more flexibility within the Poultry Product Inspection Act uh, to process uh, poultry on farm and sell at retail, whereas those um, regulations don't necessarily apply on the beef and pork side. Uh, so, you know, again, it's a little multifaceted there. I think we're, we're looking to continue finding uh, where those gaps are more specifically in the state and addressing them. Great, thank you. Um, another question uh, for anyone in the group. Can you explain what your plan is to incentivize people to get into the meat industry? We've kind of touched on that a little bit in terms of recruiting more folks, but um, if any of the panelists want to give that um, their perspective. I'll throw it, I'll throw it back at the questioner and anybody listening. It's, it's all of our, what's all of our plan? It's not the meat processors that have to or can carry this. Um, I, I'll tell you, um, you know, we we pay pretty well, and you know, like you know, there's there's only so much that we can do. This this is a this is a national conversation. You know, we we can't be saying to people, and this goes for all trades. Quite honestly, we can't be saying you need to get an education so you don't have to work, which is basically the message for at least my lifetime. You need to go to school, get a degree so that you don't have to break your back, so that your knees are still with you at 50 years old, so your back is not broken at 60 years old, so, you know, your hands still work. Like, the, the, the fact is, if you don't, if, if the people, if, if we don't as a society move from here to here, if there's not a physical lifting work, it's all going to fall apart, and that's, that's where, that's what we saw, um, I think at the beginning of COVID, like it just, it just stripped it bare. It, it said, you know, everybody, you know, the whole essential versus non-essential worker and, you know, it sets up 
it sets up the separation between those of us who had to go to work because we were essential and those of us who didn't. Um, so I think that we're all at a, I mean, one of the themes in my thinking lately has been like, what is the base level of stress that we are all under as people right now? This is way off the conversation or the question, but we're all under the stress. And one of them is the separation, the scarification of, that's not the right word, but the, uh, you know, the grades in society or whatever. And, you know, we, we shouldn't do this to each other. Uh, we shouldn't do it to our children. Uh, we, we should be encouraging physical labor. That's, it's, it's what it is. No, your point's well made. Um, uh, someone is um, asking again what the P Penn State program for education and training is. And I'd be happy to have one of the panelists answer that, but I'm hoping that John Campbell himself, who's on the uh, listening session, might be able to put his whatever detail he would like to share with the group in the chat box. And, and that way people can go directly um, to that. Um, I'm gonna go to another question. Um, with the next round of Federal CARES Act funding likely to be passed before the end of the year, um, does Josh have any insights on whether Governor Wolf and PDA are planning to dedicate funding for a second round of the Fresh Food Financing Initiative uh, COVID grant as well um, as was done with the prior CARES Act? It's a great question. Um, I don't unfortunately have any insight uh, or, or more insight than I think all of us have at this point. Um, we are certainly um, pushing for more funding, especially for programs like the Fresh Food Financing Initiative COVID Relief Fund, which was extremely successful as far as the, you know, the awardees and the amounts that were provided to just a slew of um, different folks in the retail sector, whether it was meat processors or uh, the restaurant uh, industry or supermarkets, um, farmers markets. So we're absolutely supportive of that. We were hoping for things like that, but right now we're all just kind of waiting to see uh, where, where things lie with the budget. Um, someone else is asking what the difference is between a retail exempt and a custom exempt slaughter facility. I'm hoping one of you can answer that question. Okay, so I'll, I'll you know, I, I should mention that I, I don't uh, represent the Food Safety Bureau at the Department of Agriculture, and I don't work for uh, the United States Department of Agriculture, so I'm speaking from my own uh, background here. Uh, and you can certainly uh, research this. It's available, you know, on, you, know, you can search for uh, uh, retail exempt um, uh, meat process or, or yeah, meat processes or custom exempt butchers. So what, what we generally are talking about uh, when we talk about custom exempt slaughter, um, the difference there is uh, that would be a processor who is not USDA inspected, federally inspected, doesn't have a grant of inspection like someone like Jay would. Uh, and that processor can take an animal that is owned by uh, a consumer and slaughter it, process it any way that that consumer uh, would be uh, requesting and then provide that meat directly back to the consumer. That meat is not for sale and it cannot go into commerce. So you can't sell it at farmer's markets. You cannot sell it at any other retail outlet. A retail exempt butcher shop would receive inspected meat. So this could be, could be a carcass, half carcass, um, or, or other primals, subprimals, whatever they may be. And that butcher shop is allowed to further process it. And there's a little bit of nuance there about what they can do, but generally it's cutting, grinding, um, you know, different basic raw processing uh, that you'd find at a butcher or meat counter and then sell that direct to consumer. So that meat has already been slaughtered at a USDA inspected facility but that butcher shop is not necessarily inspected like uh, a, a federally inspected plant would. And that's basically the difference. Thank you. It's a, it's a very complicated industry, um, but that was very helpful. I have a couple quick questions for Jay. Um, a lot of people are interested in, in the processing side of the business. Um, first, what are some of the best strategies that you've found for recruiting and retaining your team members? 
And second, just a general question of what kind of meat do you cut on a daily basis? Um, let's answer the second one first. So right now we're, we're, cutting, we're cutting animals for Brooks Miller, North Mountain Pastures. This morning we cut, uh, and those, those are cut, what we call cutters, like steaks and that sort of thing, steaks and roasts. And then this morning we cut a bunch of boner cows. Uh, they'll go into burgers. Uh, they'll go to a, a further processor to be made into patties, that sort of thing. Um, we will be, you know, we, we slaughter bison, bison, beef, lamb, um, goat, <clears throat> pig, uh, and ostrich. We slaughter ostrich as well. So we do do a little bit of poultry, but not the poultry we've been talking about earlier. Um, so on a regular basis, uh, you know, on a, on, a, on a strong day, we're doing eight to nine head of beef on a on a slow day when there's a lot of particular cutting, it might be three to four head of beef, that sort of thing. If it's lambs, uh, which we, during COVID, we've done very few lambs, very few pigs because the beef schedule just got so full so fast, it just kind of pushed everything else out, which is frustrating to our customers. Um, but um, it, it varies. I guess the, the answer is that it varies. Um, what was the other part of the question? How do you encourage people uh, into recruit. the profession? Yeah. Recruit. So we um, yeah, recruiting. It. We. T I talk to everybody. Um, you know, I, I never know who I'm talking to, and you know, if I tell everybody I talk to, you need to encourage the people around you to go into this business. Um, you know, we're looking for good people. You know, and I don't care if the person has, you know, an English major. If if he or she has a brain, brain in the back, is how I say it. You know, you, you you're looking for the person. Um, you know, early on, I mean, I've been doing this for eight years now, and I didn't have any background in it before. I only am here. I didn't do it because I knew what I was doing. I did it because it needed to be done. And so I've learned a lot in the eight years. Um, and early on, my guys would pressure me to, you know, if, if I was going to hire somebody, hire somebody who knew what they were doing walking in the door. The fact is, those people don't exist. And if they do, they're already working. They're already, they're already working. Or they're already retired, you know, and they're they're past their time. And this is a very difficult. It's very difficult on your wrists, your back, uh, your legs. You know, standing on concrete, cold floors, that sort of thing. Um, so, in my opinion, the people you are recruiting are you're 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 looking for a good person. You're looking for a person that is kind, that is compassionate, that is intelligent, that is responsive to direction. I mean, you can't have. You can't have your inspector come up and say you need to do this and the person says well you're not the boss of me you know um you know we've we've got to have people that can relate to one another um in a room you know we're, we're careful around one another we care about one another um and when you don't have that it, it really it really tears things down fast you also have people have to have people that are consistent that they can do the same thing day in day out because the customer um you know, when you, when you plan your year out, you know, we've never been in a situation before where we were so far scheduled ahead, you know, like that's, that's, that's the providence of places like Smuckers and Leona, you know, with scheduling 365 days out, we've never been there. Now we are like, maybe not quite that far, but so much further than, but if we plan, like if I tell to use names, to use a name that's very frustrated with me right now, like to, if I tell Kinley Coulter that I'm going to kill six beef for him in May, and then in, like I tell him that in May, and then it comes, and it's going to be for June or August, and then we get to August, and I can only do two of them, or four of them, you know, it's, you, I guess what I'm getting at is, you think you're going to, we think that we're going to have these set of circumstances. We're gonna have a new cooler. This person is still gonna be with us. This person isn't gonna have gotten sick. This person isn't gonna call off that day. Um, you know, it, it comes back, I'll go back to the mission driven thing. You know, your employees, um, you're, you're burdening your employees with being consistent and being able to be counted on. And that's a very difficult thing. Like, uh, we don't have we don't have the privilege to be able to call off. No, we do. It happens, and it right. affects it affects everybody in this plant. It affects everybody out there. You know. Right. Um, 
Well, that's 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 a that's a great yeah. call. Um, I'm hoping that Jared's um, students um, are hearing the call there, um, would would consider this. Yeah. And um, thank you. Um, I have a couple questions for Mike. Um, someone asks which animal is the most profitable, and I think I know the answer. Um, how you would answer this, but we'd love to hear it anyway. Um, do you support selling meat locally compared to across the country? Uh, I, I would have to say pigs probably, uh, just because grass fed and finished beef take about 27 to 30 months to get done. Uh, silver pastured hogs uh, do really well when there are lots of acorns and apples and stuff to eat, uh, beside the supplemental feed that we provide and they get done in about seven or eight months. Uh, which is a couple of more months than most folks run market hogs, but um, we, we like them a little bit bigger, and and uh, and it seems like invariably it times out to they're finishing right when the apples are dropping, or they're finishing right when the hazelnuts are dropping. So we kind of uh, run a couple of batches a year, and I would have to say uh, profitability wise, probably pork, just because of the short turnaround. Um, what was the second question? I'm sorry. Whether you promote selling locally or, or nationally? Very definitely locally. We, our, our, our food's traveling way too far to get to us. Uh, the, the more we can support our local economies by supporting the folks who create, make food in our, our local economies, uh, the better everybody's going to be. There's really no practical reason to be shipping beef from Brazil to uh, Kansas City to be broken down and labeled product to the United States and into your grocery store when the guy up the road's raising some really good quality stuff that will blow anything out of the water that comes from Brazil anyhow. <laughs> so uh, there's a, uh, uh, a strong case to be made for reducing your footprint through reducing your food miles. And I know that that's a, an argument that's been made over and over again over the years, but it really does lift a lot of boats. If, if your local community is doing well, you're doing well. So we get to choose three times a day and, and cast a vote three times a day with our fork. Uh, I recommend doing as much of that with food that's sourced from Pennsylvania or at least in this region as possible. And it's, it's very doable. Well, like Jay pointed out earlier, we're in a, a great spot for local food. I mean, honestly, Pennsylvania should be head and shoulders even above everybody. We're already number one in direct sales. So it, we're close to uh, uh, as good as it gets any place in the United States, but I think we can do a whole lot better. And, and, and I think there's a, a movement toward that direction. So I'm real glad of that. And just to take off on, on Jay's earlier point about scheduling, you know, the producers definitely have a part to play in that. We, we have gotten complacent over the years where, you know, I would call Jay, Jay's too far from me. Otherwise I would be uh, one of those guys calling up and saying, Hey, Jay, I don't care what happens to other people's. I have to, no, I wouldn't. But I mean, uh, having that relationship with your processor is helpful, but it doesn't really help in the big picture. We're really have abused the system. Not I, I've trained myself to, to schedule all, on, all my poultry out uh, back in January. In, in January every year, I make all my poultry buys for the year and I schedule all my slaughter dates because that's what's necessary to get in there. So there's no reason why I couldn't do that same thing with beef, lamb, pork. To some degree, we know when we've got those animals, when we get those animals onto the farm or when they're born or even how long it's going to be until it's time to go down the road. And conveying that information to the processor would really help to manage their workflow a lot better, do a lot better planning, uh, staff accordingly when necessary, expand their uh, capacity to, to store or, or process or whatever. So it's the, the processor's got a part to play, but the biggest, most important uh, part of it is the consumer. It's, uh, it's all about um, maintaining that, that spike in sales that all of us local producers and processors saw at the beginning of this pandemic. And thankfully, a lot of folks have stayed the course through. And probably once they get a taste for it, they're going to be spoiled on anything. You know, they, they'll they never be able to go back to just going by and box meat from the grocery store again. So, um, but I, I probably blathered on longer than I needed to, but I wanted to get- <laughs> Well, well said, well said. 
No, you had a lot of great points there. And my favorite being vote with your fork. Um, I think we should get t-shirts with that. Um, I think it's a really good point. Consumers have a lot to say. Um, Dr. Chris, this... we're pulling with that, even though I can script it at every uh, Okay. Okay. Um, we're I... getting close to the end here. Yes, please. So um, just to, to jump off, Mike had mentioned about the consumers voting with their fork and then somebody had asked earlier what are we doing to encourage um, you know encourage people to get into the business but at at the uh, it is not it is not necessarily the responsibility of the shops to create this environment it's like when it comes to consumers buying you know you hear people say I want fresh I want local I want organic the consumer it does come down to the consumer it does come down to all of us if we're going to support this system, and you say, you say yes, I want these things. Then you need to stick with it and buy it, and and support support the chain because con farmers farmers plant in concrete, not whims. Um, I've, I've you know you know you get you get some companies come in and say I'm going to buy 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 I'm going to sell sell sell, and so we start we we literally expand our plant to handle that. Farmers expand their barns to handle that. They've put posts in ground they bought cattle they're depending on you coming through so yeah they're at the, at, at the at the far end of that we're depending on the consumer coming through i'm sorry my phone keeps going off but um it's so not, we're all we're it's part of an, the, the, a continuum here from consumer to ecosystem. producer to processor and everybody in between and pda somewhere on on top of that um yeah it does take everybody i do want to wrap up just because we're about three minutes out and um there are a couple of questions in here that we didn't get to to which i apologize i did want to say that if you um we're, we're going to send out a recording of this um webinar and we're going to include the four of us as resources so you can follow up with whichever of us is more appropriate with your question. If it didn't get answered, there were a couple of quick ones for PASA, um, which I would just sort of uh, summarize as saying, what are you guys doing on this issue next? Um, we're gonna continue to um, have this dialogue to, with as many of you as are interested. Um, we're gonna continue to monitor the federal and state uh, legislation that comes through some of the grant opportunities make those um, available to you through PASA um, and just to continue to advocate for um, flexibility and for um, more opportunities and more options both for producers, consumers and processors. Um, we've been very fortunate to have you know all three points of view and uh, the state agriculture agency today so I want to thank Josh, I want to thank Mike and I want to thank Jay especially those um, of you who are taking time out of your busy, busy days. Um, I hope that you got something out of this and I hope we'll continue this dialogue. Um, I wanna thank everybody who was on the call. Um, and um, as far as I, I, I think this is uh, true, we will probably take this topic up at our winter conference, which will be virtual this year in January and February. So we'll be continuing to discuss this and follow legislation, get new ideas um, and, and keep the discussion going. Um, so with that, I wanna thank everybody um, for your time and hope we answered some of your questions and hopefully we'll get to the rest of them. So with that, thanks for listening. Thanks to our panelists. We'll see you next time. Thanks very much. Thank you.